Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for this webinar. Every year at the beginning of the new year, we will do a prediction of what we think is going to happen in the new year. The title of our presentation this year is Year 2021, a year of preservation. For those of you who are my students, we would be inviting you to a series of brick and mortar classes where we will be diving a lot deeper into this subject matter. What is preservation? Preservation refers to a major change to the state function or direction of a system induced by an internal or external stimulus. Year 2021 can be described as a year of preservation caused by a major and unprecedented disruptor, COVID-19. In year 2021, COVID-19 will still take the center stage. It will be at the top of the minds of governmental leaders, entrepreneurs, investors, and many other persons throughout the year. 2021 will herald the start of an era that's unclear, uncertain, and unconventional. We are set to go on a roller coaster ride from relief, restoration, and recovery to renewal. The right may repeat in different ways until COVID-19 is well under control. The focus of 2021 will very much be on executing the biggest manufacturing, delivery, and administering of the vaccines in history. However, having effective vaccines may not be the panacea for the world to fully return to normality and to support economic recovery. It will take a lot of hard work and time to vaccinate adequate number of people to achieve herd immunity. To do that, at least two-thirds of the populations will have to be vaccinated. It will not be until 2024 at the earliest that a critical number of the world's population of about 7.8 billion can be vaccinated to resist the virus and break the, the chain of transmission and reduce severity of the infection to a manageable level. If enough people are not held back by non-medical concerns and misinformation and they are properly vaccinated, they can then feel safe and comfortable to resume and enhance productive work and other activities. They can adjust to and even step up to fulfill new functions to improve their results and contributions. Unfortunately, during the vaccination program, COVID-19 and quite possibly new strains of COVID-19 will continue their rampages. 2021 will be a challenging year. As in any seismic perturbation, a crisis is a transformational point. The COVID-19 is a warning to the world and a signal that we need to not only change but also transform our ecosystem in order to survive and thrive in the future. The COVID-19 pandemic will accelerate shifts of major tectonic plates that will influence future landscapes. In this webinar, we will examine some of these major tectonic plates and how they will impact the economy and markets. First, we will examine how the COVID-19 pandemic will accelerate the need to rebuild the liberal international order to become a new global order. Second, we will review one of the major mega shifts in economics, the impact of the United States-China relations, and why the trade war will eventually become an era of cold peace. Third, the COVID-19 pandemic will accelerate the shift to the fourth industrial revolution. We will see how Internet of Things will eventually become intelligence of everything. Fourth, we will see a reawakening of conscience for protecting and sustaining the environmental and more specifically on how growing at all costs 
including damaging the environment, will not work. And why we need to work towards achieving sustainable growth. The world as we know it is increasingly coming to an end. We are moving towards an exciting new world of abnormal. In such a situation, many people are looking for predictions. While it is important to make sense of possible trends and happenings, it is equally important to prepare for all possible scenarios. It is incumbent upon every government, organizations, and individuals to plan and prepare for potential challenges and respond to these challenges effectively and efficiently. Capitalize on opportunities in every challenge to make 2021 and beyond a purposeful, fruitful, and fulfilling era. In this webinar and subsequent webinars, I will be covering opportunities and challenges in the new economy and how you can survive and thrive in a new, exciting world of abnormal. Let me quickly go through with you the outline of this webinar. In this webinar, we will examine mega shifts of four tectonic plates that will shape and influence future landscapes. First, we will examine the COVID-19 vaccination program and what it takes to achieve stabilization. Second, we will review the need to refresh the liberal international order to develop a new global order. Third, we will study the US-China relations and why the trade war can possibly lead to an era of cold peace. Last but not least, we will examine how the world will need to work together to protect, preserve, and even proactively improve the environment. We cannot afford to grow at all costs at the expense of the health of our planet. We need to work towards sustainable growth. Let me cover the COVID-19 pandemic, how we will go from vaccination to stabilization. The COVID-19 pandemic is at an unprecedented scale. The speed and severity of the virus transmission are also unpredicted. Most countries were caught unprepared. At the beginning of 2021, more than 93 million people have been infected by the virus. There are more than 2 million registered fatalities. Unfortunately, these numbers are still on the increase. Currently, there are more than 200 vaccine candidates that have been tested on a limited number of humans. More than a dozen of them are already in advanced clinical trials. By the first half of 2021, we should see more vaccines being approved by various countries for administering to the general public. The severity of this pandemic and effectiveness of reform. Sorry, let me repeat again. The severity of the pandemic and effectiveness of response differs from country to country and from community to community. Although some countries have done well, the transmission rate can still flare up as had happened in Hong Kong and South Korea. Many experts believe that it will get worse before it gets better, especially after the celebrations and gatherings during the festive seasons. Many governments have also not been the most effective in responding to the pandemic. They have either not imposed strict lockdowns or have lifted lockdowns too early. The good news is that what would have taken years to develop a vaccine has taken less than one year to develop a suite of approved vaccines. This unprecedented record is due in no small part to global collaboration between governments and non-governmental organizations and researchers from medical and other disciplines supported by a large budget. It heralds a new age for medical and biotech research and development. At the same time, it encourages the need for better cooperation, collaboration and co-creation of solutions. 
there will be new waves of infections, lockdowns, and repeated lockdowns and overwhelm healthcare system from time to time and in many countries. They will be unable to have complete freedom of movement, open up their countries, and focus on economic recovery. Let's look at some of the challenges ahead. There will be major challenges throughout and even after the vaccination program. Let us examine some of the challenges to help you make better informed decision. First, adequacy and availability of vaccines. According to estimation by Duke Global Health Innovation Center, vaccine developer can produce sufficient doses for more than one third of the world's population by the end of 2021. Serum Institute, the world's largest manufacturer of vaccines, has indicated that there will not be enough vaccines for the world until 2024 or beyond. Second, vaccine nationalism and hoarding. Many developed and wealthy countries may be practicing different degrees of vaccine nationalism. In other words, they may be acquiring more vaccines than the number of people in their countries. And they are hoarding vaccines for fear of delay or breakdown and other challenges in the supply chain. Third, accessibility and availability. A majority of countries, especially those in developing countries with low income levels, may not be able to afford or access enough vaccines to protect themselves. These countries may not be adequately vaccinated until 2024. The World Health Organization, together with the Gavi Vaccine Alliance and the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, otherwise known as CEPI, is leading a global initiative called COVAX to support development of 2 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccines to at least vaccinate 20% of all populations before the end of 2021. More than 190 countries have contributed to COVAX, but the funding is still insufficient to achieve the modest goal. Fourth, execution of the vaccination program. There are challenges in rolling out the vaccination program. Developed countries such as the United States, the United Kingdom, France and Germany are finding hard to implement the vaccination programs and achieve their projected objectives. The challenges can be classified in different ways. I will not be going through every item by putting them on the slide to help you to make a better informed decision. There are challenges in the production and delivery of the vaccines. Second, there are challenges in the infrastructure and system to support vaccination. Third, there are challenges in terms of human resources. Fourth, there are challenges as far as public communication is concerned. Fifth, there are challenges in terms of documentation and follow-up programs. We also have challenges dealing with unknowns. There are still many unknowns that have not been uncovered during clinical trials of the vaccines. These are some of the challenges, as you can see on the slide. I won't go through each and every one of them. Case in point, the Pfizer BioNTech is not recommended for people with a history of anaphylaxis or severe allergic reactions. It is also not recommended for people who are severely immunocompromised, pregnant women and children under 16. We also have challenges as far as the mutation or the potential mutation of COVID-19 and new strains. There are new strains that can be treated with current vaccines. Virus can and do mutate all the time, and it is part of natural evolution. New variants of COVID-19 can cause new challenges. 
Case in point, the B117 new variant emerged in September 2020, and it has been transmitted to different countries, including the United States, France, India, and Singapore. Another variant, 501B2, was discovered in South Africa in October 2020. It has also been detected in other countries, including Britain and France. These new strains are potentially more infectious than other strains. There may be other variants that may be more transmissible or may cause higher fatalities that have not surfaced yet. Studies are being done to determine if current vaccines are effective and effective over time against these vaccines. German vaccine developer BioNTech is confident of developing a new vaccine that would work on mutated versions. However, the new vaccine may have to undergo a series of clinical tests and be subjected to peer reviews, approval by healthcare authorities, and other procedures before they can be administered to the general public. There will also be new strains of virus that cannot be treated with existing vaccines. The more challenging possibility is that new strains of COVID-19 or new viruses can arise which may render current vaccines ineffective and cause other diseases or even start another pandemic. Case in point, a mutated strain of the virus was found to have spread among the mink population in Denmark in November 2020. Fortunately, all the mink, as far as I know, have been culled to prevent the new strain of virus from being transmitted to humans. There are concerns that current vaccines are not effective against the mutated strain. It is challenging to eradicate all new strains of COVID-19. If and when a new strain is detected, the local authorities would have to stop or delay the transmission through stringent contact tracing, quarantine programs, and lockdowns. They have to be stricter in terms of imposing longer duration of working from home, wearing better masks, having better ventilation, and regular and rigorous disinfection of public places. There are also challenges from fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic will deepen depth level, poverty, social and intergenerational mobility, and employment and employability challenges. It will widen inequality across different fault lines of class, race, gender, and other divides. At the same time, it will accelerate criminal activities, social unrest, and environmental degradation. So what do we expect in 2021 and beyond? So what can we expect in 2021 and beyond? First, there won't be a return to normality, nor will there be a post COVID-19 world in 2021. We will continue. We will have to continue to coexist with the virus. Our normal routines will include wearing masks, regular and proper washing or sanitizing of the hands, maintaining safe distancing, avoiding of crowded and confined spaces, supporting contact tracing and testing, practicing stricter hygiene and adhering to restrictions on travel and gathering, including cross-border physical activities. What is our first line of defense? Our first line of defense of COVID, our first line of defense against COVID-19 falls on each and every one of us. In my humble opinion, there is a strong case for vaccination. Why? First, nobody can tell whether he or she can catch the virus even if he or she takes the highest possible level of safety and protective measures. Second, the risk of catching the virus and suffering 
from the resulting consequences is much higher and probably more severe than any potential risk of being vaccinated. The Lancet, a highly regarded medical journal, has just published a study on post-COVID-19 syndrome in its 8th of January 2021 issue. Researchers from Wuhan, China, followed 1,733 discharged COVID-19 patients for about six months and found that about 76% had at least one of the following syndromes. And these syndromes include fatigue or muscle weakness, sleep difficulties, hair loss, smell disorder, palpitations, joint pain, reduced appetite, and taste disorders. Other smaller studies have suggested that COVID-19 infection may cause long-term damages in patients' brains, hearts, and lungs. So it is better to be vaccinated if you are given an opportunity. Do not assume that there will always be a supply of vaccines. It is possible that the supply of vaccines may be disrupted. Let me give you an example. Taiwan prohibited the exports of face masks in January 2020. And as a result, it affected many countries, including Singapore. In April 2020, Mr. Donald Trump invoked the Defense Production Act to compel 3M, the company that manufactures the N95 respirator mask, to give priority to fulfilling demands for the N95 mask in the United States. In April 2020, the then President Donald Trump invoked the Defense Production Act to compel 3M, the company that manufactures the N95 respirator mask, to give priority to fulfilling demands for the N95 mask in the United States. In short, as the proverb goes, prevention is better than cure. It is better to be safe than sorry. Third, the approved vaccine is relatively safe. According to Mr. Tedros at Hannon, Director General of World Health Organization, more than 30.5 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines have been administered in 49 higher income countries. According to a survey by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the rate of severe allergic reaction is only about 11.1 cases per million doses. The Health Science Authority and its panel of experts have done their research and conducted due diligence before issuing approval for the vaccine. Fourth, vaccinating yourself is also about protecting your loved ones and those around you, including your friends, colleagues, neighbors, relatives, customers, and associates. In doing so, you will be in a better position to live or work with or take care of your community. Conversely, the people around you do not have to invest resources in potentially taking care of you. Fifth, nobody knows for sure if there will be another surge of transmission that may possibly overstretch our healthcare system and other resources. By being vaccinated, it helps to delay or break the chain of transmission and flatten or even obliterate the curve. If we can restrain the rate of transmission, we can also lower the chance of new strains of viruses being developed. Our healthcare system can then better focus on treating COVID-19 and other patients. If our country is able to vaccinate enough people, and that is at least 70% of our population to achieve mass immunity, we can return to normalcy or at least some semblance of normalcy and then we can pursue a better quality of life. Six, the government 
can better focus on tackling other national issues, including economic recovery and transforming our country to achieve the next level of growth. By the way, currently there's no evidence to prove that a vaccinated person would not be a carrier of COVID-19 and therefore will not transmit the virus to others. Seven, please help to spread the values, importance and benefits of vaccination. Eight, if nothing else, be vigilant about not sharing or spreading any negative news or conspiracy theories that have not been verified by credible and independent authorities. If you do it, you may be potentially preventing others from making proper decisions and causing undue alarm to and reactions from the public. In 2021, there will be more deployment of cheap and rapid antigen test kits, some of which may even be portable. These kits are easier and faster to deploy than polymerase chain reaction, otherwise known as PCR, and other antibody testing programs. Currently, there are more than 80 of such kits being developed and tested for commercial use. It is unlikely it is likely that accuracy of the results will improve over time. Antigen tests are less unpleasant to administer and they produce faster results. They lower societal costs and costs arising from lockdowns, delays and interruptions in workplaces. Antigen testing will most likely replace many temperature screening systems at immigration checkpoints and other critical areas and for use as part of major pre-event activities. As prices drop to an affordable level, use of these kits may become part of a daily routine. In the process of carrying out the vaccination program, there is a need to strengthen and innovate other options for treatments or therapeutics. Vaccination can help prevent a person from being infected where else therapeutic can help infected persons recover from the virus. To handle current and future challenges from the COVID-19 pandemic, there will most likely be more targeted stimulus packages to overcome challenges and catalyze economic recovery. There's a need for global cooperation, collaboration and co-creation of solutions to strengthen preparedness, response, and resilience. More vigilant surveillance, early warning system, and response mechanism will have to be put in place on an international level. The COVID-19 pandemic has taught us that we need to act decisively and early, even without perfect knowledge. We should err on the side of caution and then adjust and adapt correspondingly in accordance with new evidence, findings, and other information. Let's now examine the geopolitical tectonic plate. There is a clarion call to refresh the liberal international order. All countries are virtually operating on spaceship Earth, interconnected to and inter dependent upon each other. The journey forward cannot be about us or them. We are all in it together. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown that no government can resolve an international crisis alone. The government can go its way, but international crisis can go in every which way and leave behind a trail of damages and destruction. Governments have to work on a multilateral basis to contain and resolve the crisis. Case in point, if medical researchers and other professionals in different parts of the world did not collaborate with one another, it would not have been possible to develop the suite of vaccines in record time. Without multilateral collaboration, COVID-19 cannot be tamed and tackled. If COVID-19 is not properly controlled, 
both domestic as well as global economies cannot fully recover and progress to a higher level. Every country, even if it has adequate vaccines, is not safe unless the rest of the world is safe. No country can adequately control the pandemic unless the pandemic can be adequately controlled in other countries, both near and far. Besides tackling COVID-19, there is a clarent call for the global community to work together to address major threats that cut across borders and boundaries. These transnational threats, including threats related to climate change, organized crime, natural disasters, pollutions, international terrorism, religious and racial extremism, cyber attacks, human trafficking, refugee crisis, nuclear proliferation, trade and commerce barriers, human rights, animal welfare, inequality, global health issues, and the depletion of major natural resources such as forest, fresh water, and food supply. Although these threats may not have reached global systemic and unmanageable levels, they can escalate rapidly and cause severe damages and destructions to the world. They can have a devastating effect on any country and its people. In short, there is a growing drive to refresh the liberal international order. Let me give you some background of the liberal international order. After World War I and II, the United States and its allies pioneered an open and rules-based after World War, after World Wars I and II, the United States and its allies pioneered an open and rule-based liberal international order to promote peace, human rights, and capitalism. They had also launched many key initiatives to ensure that humanity would not have to go through the deep pain and sorrow of another devastating war. The liberal order was premised on the belief that humans share core experiences, values, interests, and aspirations. They should work together to widen common spaces and serve mutual benefits. To achieve progress, they should remove undue roadblocks to trade and commerce and promote appropriate exchange of ideas, knowledge, expertise, finance, and talents between countries and on a global basis. International institutions were started to craft and implement guiding principles and rules-based systems to help countries collaborate, cooperate, and co-create solutions with one another. For example, the United Nations was started to maintain international peace and security, develop friendly relations among nations, achieve international cooperation, and be a center for harmonizing the actions of nations. The World Trade Organization has helped to create and implement free trade agreements. The World Bank provided and facilitated aids to deserving countries. The International Monetary Fund fostered global monetary cooperation, secured financial stability, facilitated international trade, promoted high employment and sustainable economic growth, and reduced poverty around the world. What are the benefits of the liberal international order? The liberal international order lifted millions out of poverty and brought about more than seven decades of relative world peace and progress. It created a relatively open trading environment that underpinned economic growth internationally. As a result of growth in trade, the United States became the strongest superpower and the richest economy in the world. 
it also helped the Americans enjoy one of the highest standards of living. The liberal international order had also improved the economies of many developed and developing countries. Many poor countries benefited from foreign direct investments, trans technology transfer, and a more conducive trading environment. Global competition and collaboration, global competitive Global, sorry, global competition and collaboration promoted greater innovations that enhance efficiency and positive impacts. The liberal international order improved billions of lives and livelihoods all over the world and lifted many out of poverty. It contributed to the longest stretch of peace and progress in modern history. Through the international order, there were better understandings between nations and stronger engagements and exchanges among them. It had helped to promote better bridges and bondings between people from different cultures, communities, and countries. The world was better off collaborating for collective peace security and progress than competing to promote partisan ideology, interest, and aspirations. As it stands, there is no other model that is as widely accepted as the liberal international order, nor assumed to be able to achieve similar or better outcomes. However, the liberal international order had to undergo numerous iterations. Previous arrangements had to be improved in order to ensure that the order stays relevant to new realities. The collective leadership of many far-sighted, competent, and inspirational heads of states and various leaders in the United States and other countries led the necessary changes to bring about arguably the golden age of world history. Unfortunately, in recent times, it was also the lack of far-sighted, competent and inspirational leadership that contributed to improving the order that's increasingly becoming irrelevant. The lack of good leadership pulls the brakes on a generally positive trend of peace and progress. Case in point, while the drive for globalization carries many upsides, it has also many downsides, including growth of unhealthy values, unfair trade practices, lack of effective regulatory measures to control advanced technology, and negative impacts on the environment. Conjointly, there was a lack of coordinated strategies and major initiatives to address and resolve these downsides and to develop and implement an environmentally sustainable and socially responsible model for the global community. What are the fallouts of the liberal international order? In the process of unfettered development, climatic conditions and the environment in general have suffered. Many governments were not able to distribute wealth from economic growth equitably and rewards of progress inclusively. They had also failed to improve social spending to help those who fall between the cracks and were left behind. Governments were not able to mobilize key stakeholders from the political, public, private and people sectors to help workers upgrade themselves, adapt to the new environment, stay relevant and productive, and leverage on opportunities in the global economy. In many quarters of the global economy, expectations and demands have gone up because of better education, access of information, and better interconnectivity and interaction. There was a growing concern about losing jobs to lower paid workers from other countries and the risk of disruption and displacement by advanced technology. 
wages have not grown in tandem with economic growth. Social inequality and income gaps have been widening. Many were struggling to maintain their current quality of life and feeling stagnant, abandoned, or left behind. There was a declining sense of identity, belonging, and place in society. Major turbulences in a volatile, uncertain, ambiguous environment such as the COVID-19 pandemic. Multiple turbulences in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environment such as the COVID-19 pandemic were also driving an increase in anxiety, angst, and anger. As two politicians have capitalized on these fears and frustrations and exploited human frailties to fulfill their political ambitions. Many of them rode on waves of populism in order to win power and overrun their oppositions. They became more focused on domestic issues and less concerned about how to improve international relations to serve mutual interest and achieve greater good. For example, Mr. Trump had been deliberately or unwittingly carrying out Trump exits, an unprecedented process that was breaking down the liberal international order. Mr. Trump was perceived to be skeptical about multilateral systems, international institutions, allies and partners, and global initiatives. He had withdrawn or threatened to withdraw from major international institutions or agreements, including the World Trade Organization, United Nations Human Rights Council, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, Trans-Pacific Partnership, Paris Agreement on Climate Change, UNESCO, and the Joint Comprehensive Plan on Action to Contain Iran. Mr. Trump seemed to be withdrawing the United States from playing a leadership role in the global community. He was considered by many to be only interested in playing an active role and if not a domineering role, just so that he could put America first and make America great. Unfortunately, Mr. Trump is not alone. A growing number of politicians are promoting nationalism and nativism and resorting to protectionist measures to govern their countries in the hope that by turning inwards, the issues at hand will be resolved. Problems in the world will never impact their countries or that these problems will somehow disappear over time. The liberal international order is left without enough authoritative voices to promote, defend, and improve it. There is a lack of credible leadership to reform the liberal international order to meet the progressive and diverse needs of the fourth industrial revolution. So what can be done to reimagine, redesign, and renew a new order? With international threats looming across the horizon, the global community needs to work together more than at any time in history to refresh the liberal international order. There is a greater urgency to redesign the current liberal international order or reinvent a new global order with relevant and effective principles, rules, and systems to manage the fast-changing landscapes. Refresh international institutions to enhance governance, provide assistance to needy and deserving people and communities, and strengthen sustainability of the planet. Revitalize multilateral commitments and agreements, and re-engineer existing systems and initiatives to achieve greater good on a global basis. The global community needs to better connect, collaborate, and co-create solutions together. For example, prediction of a devastating pandemic has been around for a long time. And yet, 
when COVID-19 pandemic happened, few countries were fully prepared for the pandemic. Unless and until the world learns how to work effectively together, the world may just possibly be one major crisis away from total destruction. In 2021 and beyond, there is a growing need to develop a new global order. How then can the new global order be developed? The new global order can be constructed through a top-down or bottom-up and peer-to-peer -peer approach. Since World War II, the United States has played an important role in developing global economic and financial architecture and trade and commerce system. It was instrumental in building international institutions and systems that played a major part in helping the world enjoy the longest stretch of global peace, progress and prosperity. The United States is one of the major beneficiaries of the growth. As an internationalist, President Joe Biden would know that any inclination towards extreme nationalism, isolationism, and unilateralism will not serve the United States' interests in an interconnected and interdependent world. After settling major domestic affairs, Mr. Biden will be inclined to strengthen international institutions and promote multilateralism. He has been quoted to have said that his administration will, let me quote, regain the trust and confidence of a world that has begun to find ways to work around us or with us. In general, many developed countries are also looking forward to the United States to upgrade these institutions and help to restore them to proper functionality. Mr. Biden has indicated that the United States will rejoin the World Health Organization, the Paris Climate Accord, and the Comprehensive Plan of Action on Iran's nuclear program signed by Tehran and five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council together with Germany. He will reverse Mr. Trump's action on deferred action for childhood arrivals and the Muslim ban, which bars entries of nationals from seven Muslim majority countries, including Iran, Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. Mr. Biden and his administration will likely champion liberal democratic values and make it a guiding principle of United States foreign policy. They will work towards updating the open and rules-based international order, especially rules governing global trade and commerce. Champion liberal democratic values, which include high labor, human rights, intellectual property, and environmental standards. Obviously, these values work in favor of the United States industries and enterprises, while at the same time contribute to a better world. President Biden and his administration would prefer to prime the work of upgrading the crumbling multilateral system rather than let another country or group of countries do it, especially China and countries that are supporting China. If the United States doesn't take the lead, it may gradually be left behind in a new economy. Meanwhile, there's another ground up and peer to peer initiative that's gradually reshaping a new global order. The United States will not fail to notice that China, being the second largest economy in the world, is playing a major role in this initiative. For example, China has signed the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or RCP in short. The RCP is endorsed by 14 other countries. Collectively, they account for about 30% of the world's population, which is about 2.2 billion people, and about 30% of global GDP, which is about $26.2 trillion as of 2020. The RCEP is the largest free trade bloc in history. As a free trade bloc, it is bigger than the European Union 
and the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement. China has also indicated that it is considering to be part of the comprehensive and progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. 11 countries have signed the CPTPP. Their combined economies represent 13.4% of the global gross domestic product or approximately 13.5 trillion US dollars. The CPTPP is the fourth largest free trade agreement in the world by GDP after the United States, Mexico, Canada agreement, the European single market, and the Regional Comprehensive and Economic Partnership. Both the RCEP and the CPTPP are projected to grow in the near future. China has also signed the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, or CAI in short, with the European Union in December 2020, despite strong opposition from the United States. China is doing everything possible to build relations with the European Union to ensure that the EU's 27 members do not gang up with the United States to go against China. Although it will take several months for the RCEP and the CAI to take effect, these agreements are strong indications that many countries would still support an open and rules-based order for trade and commerce. Besides the strategic implications of the agreements, it's also a feather in the cap for China's diplomatic advancement. The liberal international order will be upgraded either from a top-down approach with leaders of developed countries coming to the table to work on it or through various ground-up initiatives, including free trade and other agreements. It is likely that more countries will sign and support these and other similar agreements. In the not distant future, we should see the rise of a new global order. Let's now look at another major tectonic plate, the US-China relation. The US-China relations are at a low point. Mr. Donald Trump, when he was the president, has accused China of spreading COVID-19 to the United States and other parts of the world. He claimed to have evidence that a laboratory in China was the source of the COVID-19 outbreak. He has not shared any details. He has also accused China of not letting the world know about the virus earlier and causing severe damages to the US economy. He could be blaming China to divert attention from his approach in tackling the pandemic and for the negative impact of COVID-19 on the US economy. Whatever the case, the thief between Trump and China is but only the tip of the iceberg. The US and China are two of the largest economies in the world. Collectively, they account for about 40% of global economic outputs. And that's why the trade war and health of their economies can have major impacts on the developed world. In addition, the United States and China invest substantially in military capabilities and are two of the strongest nuclear powers in the world. They power a major part of global trade and commerce, including research and development in cutting edge systems and technologies that shape the fourth industrial revolution. The US-China relations can shape the new global order and how countries can participate and collaborate in the new world. For example, the tit for tat responses in the US-China trade war may cause the world to take a more cautious approach in economic activity and adopt a more protectionist an inward-looking position. Such a position can only affect economic stability and growth. As it is, the OECD, World Bank and IMF have predicted a slowdown in global economy. If the US-China trade war worsens, 
it will exacerbate the slowdown and potentially cause other negative consequences, including social hardships and even unrest. To understand the US-China trade war, we need to analyze its root causes, study many of the reasons behind the trade disagreements, tensions, and even conflicts, and analyze their outcomes, or at least analyze their potential outcomes and impacts. Then we can look at ways to respond to the ensuing challenges so as to achieve greater good. The US-China trade war is more than just a trade war. The trade war is but only a symptom of a prolonged better for geopolitical dominance. More specifically, a better for global geopolitical, ideological, economic, military, social, cultural, technological, and perhaps space faring influences. Let's look at some of the potential root causes for the trade war. First, trade deficits. One of the main causes is the huge and growing U.S. trade deficits with China. When Donald Trump took the presidential office, the United States trade deficit with China was 375 billion U.S. dollar in 2017. The U.S. export to China were only 130 billion dollars, whereas imports from China were 506 billion dollar. Despite all the tariffs imposed on imports from China, there is still a trade gap even in 2020. Second, rivalry for dominance. On 18 October 2017, President Xi Jinping shared his 20 vision. On 18 October 2017, President Xi Jinping shared his 2050 vision at the 19th Chinese Communist Party's Congress. The two stages goal was to make China the top innovative nations in terms of inventing and developing advanced technology by 2035 and to be a country with global influences by 2050. Any US political leader worth his thoughts would be suspicious of China's 2050 vision and be concerned about its growing influence. China's share of global GDP has increased steadily from 1.7% about four decades ago to about 16%. According to forecasts by the Center for Economics and Business Research, China's economy is projected to overtake that of the United States in 2028, five years earlier than expected. Based on purchasing power parity, China is already the number one economy. In the new economy, the better will control. In the new economy, the better for control will be in the areas of cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, social commerce, e-commerce, financial systems, and outer space. In these areas, China is fast catching up with the United States. And in fact, it is already ahead in critical areas such as the 5G network. It is hard to envisage that the United States, which has always been at the pole position since World War II, that they would want to play catch up with China or for the matter, any other country. Third, negotiation for trade access. The United States is also leveraging on its advantages to force China to further open its door for trade and commerce and make the necessary economic reforms for trade liberalization. For example, in 2015, the Chinese government launched Made in China 2020. For example, in 2015, the Chinese government launched made in China 2025 plan to upgrade China's manufacturing base by developing 10 high-tech industries. China aims to achieve 70% of self-sufficiency 
in replacing key imported component parts, especially parts that are used in advanced technology. As it is, the Chinese government is examining the need to legislate multinational companies to share sensitive and detailed information about their technology, including source codes with local partners, authorities. Fourth, responses from China. President Xi Jinping is not taking Trump's threat and tariff barriers hands down. China has enacted its own protectionist measures and initiated tit for tat responses. The pain and shame of being invaded by the Eighth Nation Alliance comprising the United States, Austria, Hungary, Britain, France, Germany, Italy, Japan and Russia are deeply entrenched in the psyche of many leaders and people in China. Therefore, China cannot be seen to bow or bend to the United States and potentially lose another era of progress and be shamed for a thousand years. So what's the state of the US-China relations? After winning the 2020 presidential elections, President Biden has committed to restoring US global leadership and be the anchor of the rules-based liberal international order. He promised, let me quote his words, to lead the world and not retreat from it. To do so, he has to respond to the rivalry and challenge posed by China. China is deemed to be a strategic competitor by both Democratic and Republican camps. The anti-Chinese, the anti-China sentiments is felt in many quarters of the business community and society. There is a growing call to take tougher action against China. So what could be the potential responses from the United States. During the presidential election campaign, President Biden has called China a thug. He has also announced that he will not continue the strategic empathy towards China, a position he adopted when he was Obama's vice president. Instead, he believes that the United States does need to get tough with China on a whole range of issues which are, let me call him, robbing the United States and American companies of their technology and intellectual property. In January 2021, Mr. Mike Pompeo, who was then the US Secretary of State, lifted long-standing restriction on official exchanges between Americans and Taiwanese officials. The move has upset the Chinese government which sees Taiwan as part of its territory. Any official contact by a foreign government made with the Taiwanese government is deemed to be an intervention of and even a threat to China's sovereignty. This initiative just before Joe Biden takes over the presidential office is tantamount to formalizing the move as part of the Biden administration's policy. The move is like a poison pill that has been planted so that in the future, some leaders can leverage on it to criticize the Biden administration and accuse President Biden and his leaders of being soft on China. In 2021 and beyond, expect to see controversies and challenges between these two powers that will have somewhat of an effect on all of us. It's unlikely that the US or China will want to go to war with each other. Mr. Biden will maintain a working relationship with China and will not seek a full decoupling from China. As Sun Tzu, the famous Chinese military strategist would say, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Be that as it may, 
it is unlikely there will be a complete reset of relations. Mr. Biden, sorry, President Biden will not remove Mr. Trump's major measures against China. That would be a sign of weakness, and it may extract a political prize in the midterm elections in two years' time and quite possibly the next presidential election. President Biden will most likely replace Mr. Trump's Cold War stance with semblance of cold peace. The Cold War is a battle between two adversaries with a possibilities of open conflict. It can only lead to more potential heart-wrenching skirmishes and even conflicts and end up hurting both countries as China is more integrated with not only the US economy, but also with the global economy than, for instance, Russia. President Biden and his team will develop initiatives to limit China's growth, work with their network of allies and partners to exert coordinated pressures on China, restrict China's access to markets, selected products and foundational technologies of the future from artificial intelligence to quantum computing, and confront China on intellectual property violations and human rights issues and other issues in Tibet, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, Hong Kong and Taiwan. President Biden will leverage the recently established International Development Finance Corporation to counter China's influence through its Beltwood Initiative, especially in emerging economies. What would China's potential responses be like? President Xi Jinping or any member of the Politburo Standing Committee would not have a good night's sleep on the prospects of facing an alliance of some of the most developed countries against China. The leaders of China have used the trade war to unify its people, strengthen its grip on potential social unrest in Xinjiang Uyghur, Autonomous Region, Tibet, and even Hong Kong. China is working overtime to reduce its dependence on the United States, including building its knowledge and capabilities in critical technologies, such as producing microprocessor chips and development of operating systems. Invest in self-sufficiency and development of options for business, financial and technological systems. China, have, China has also beefed up its military capabilities and even sounded to its people to prepare for war. China has also taken initiatives to develop strategic relations with Russia and partnerships with a host of other countries. China will continue to leverage on vaccine diplomacy to build soft capital, as well as position itself as a responsible and responsive partner in the fight against COVID-19. It will use major platforms such as the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit in February 2021 and the World Economic Forum in May 2021 to boost its credibility and image. Chinese leaders are branding China as protectors of the global trading system as opposed to protectionist despite China's own restriction in trade and commerce. So what are the impacts of the trade war? First, negative impact on the ground. The trade war has affected both the United States and China negatively. As a result of enacting protectionist measures in a trade war between the US and China and, and their allies, as a result of enacting protectionist measures in a trade war between the US and China and their allies, prices of targeted imported products will increase. Consumers will have to not only pay more for their purchases, they may also have lesser choices resulting in a potential decrease in satisfaction levels. 
Increase in cost may cause a cascade of collateral damages to affected industries and their value chains and eventually it may also affect the economy as a whole. With the potential increase in the tariff rates, manufacturers that are dependent on the targeted goods and raw materials will have to pay more for these goods. As a result, it will also have a negative effect on the competitive edge, productivity and profits. Manufacturers may even relocate their operation to countries that are not affected by the protectionist measures and that will lead to a loss of jobs and taxes. If these operations are moved to countries with relatively low corporate governance standards, it may result in abuses of labor and destruction of the environment. Second, adverse effects on the economy. Inflation may drive the Federal Reserve to increase the interest rates and that may have a dampening effect on business growth and economic welfare and stability. Once protectionist measures are adopted, it may be difficult to remove them as it will cause hardships on companies that are reliant on such measures to protect them. Over time, these measures may prevent both countries from optimizing their specialization levels and affect efficient allocations of limited resources and thus put downside pressures on growth of the economies. Exporters that are hit by protectionist measures may have to market and channel their goods to other countries. The surge in such important goods may trigger affected countries to introduce their own protectionist measures. These will be some of the potential negative effects on the economy. President Biden has been quoted to have said that the trade war has cost the US economy 316 billion US dollar by the end of 2020. China's economic growth and industrial outputs have been dampened by the trade war. There's a number of enterprises that are moving out or considering to move out of the United States and China for fear of a prolonged trade war that may affect their businesses. Third, polarized and divided global economy. As they say, when elephants fight or make love, the grass will suffer. Many countries will somehow be dragged into the controversies and challenges between these two countries and for the matter, any great power rivalry. The concern is that they may be forced to take sides and have to undergo challenges on how to potentially operate in two major decoupled economies and in a potentially bifurcated technological environment. Fourth, possibility of mishaps. In the ensuing US-China trade war, there may be a possibility of miscalculation and misfire. Let me state an example. The smooth holy thrive. Let me share with you an example. Let me share with you a similar but not the same example. The smooth holy tariff act of 1930 was enacted to protect U.S. farmers from agricultural imports from Europe. By the time the bill made it to the U.S. Congress, additional tariffs were initiated. These tariffs caused many countries to retaliate, resulting in a trade war that deepened the extended severity of the Great Depression. What's going to happen moving forward from 2021 and beyond. The US-China trade tension is arguably one of the disruptive forces that can potentially erode our societal and future landscapes. The controversies and challenges resulting from the trade war will more likely than not continue in 2021. Both the US and China will not be able to resolve all the issues and build a common understanding to end the trade war and agree to fulfill a set of mutually beneficial interests. To resolve the impasse, leaders of both the US and China should reflect 
and consider the intended and unintended consequences of their actions and counter actions. Both countries should look into resolving their domestic problems. The US government should recognize and fix its deficiency. The US government should recognize and fix its deficient US style of democracy that's polarizing and dividing its people. Instead of putting down real and potential competitors, it should look at how to develop a blueprint to capture the future and inspire its people to support a culture for leading edge innovation initiatives and impacts. The Chinese government should upgrade its governance and promote greater responsibility and accountability as it plays its part to support and improve a rules-based international order. Leaders and governments of both countries, leaders and governments of both countries should seek common grounds and develop a positive cooperative as well as a competitive relationship to promote mutual interest and for greater good. For example, during the peak of the Cold War, the United States and Russia were able to work together to eradicate smallpox during the 1960s and 1970s. The US and China should harness contributions of thought leaders to help make sense and sensibility of the current situation and help them develop better clarity and roadmap for the road ahead. A credible, trusted and friendly mediator or a group of mediators should step in to help the two big elephants find a mutually acceptable solution before the grass between them suffers further and causes severe damages. They have to act and act fast before the trade war becomes a long drawn coal piece or even a full blown Cold War. A win win outcome will then become even harder to achieve. Meanwhile, leaders on both sides should negotiate and mediate behind closed doors. They should not shout out to their people and unwittingly or carelessly play up their emotions and make the road ahead murkier and muddier and create more potential minefields in the future. Let's look at the third tectonic plates, technology. The COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the rise of the digital economy. It has changed mindsets, behaviors, and habits towards use of technology to support lives, livelihoods, and lifestyles. According to a McKinsey Global Survey of Executives in July 2020, companies have accelerated the digitalization of their customer and supply chain interactions and of their internal operations by three to four years. And the share of digital or digital enabled products in their portfolios has accelerated by a shocking seven years. Another report by UBS Global Wealth Management commented that the pandemic has made more people rely on and become comfortable with doing things digitally over the internet. Year 2021 will see an accelerated pace to fulfill technology democratization. Year 2021 will see an accelerated pace to fulfill technology democratization. In other words, ordinary people in the developed world can have access to IT training tools and technologies to help them in their daily living without having to consult IT professionals or IT departments. They can do so through, for instance, mobile technology, apps, social commerce, and cloud-based and other technologies running on 5G network. There will be a proliferation of so-called low-code and no-code tools that can help end users of technology resolve personal as well as organizational problems and develop solutions. Artificial intelligence, 
data analytics and data sharing, automation and other tools can assist them to achieve results in a better, faster and easier way. Workers are more compelled to make better use of technology to help them work from home and from anywhere on their own or as parts of a virtual team. Use of technology will become an integral, vital and habitual part of their working lives. Organizations have come to realize that without adopting best practice in the use of technology, they cannot have greater resilience to survive and thrive during the pandemic. Through technology, they can have an edge in terms of enhancing adaptability, efficiency, productivity, security, agility, and customer loyalty. There is an accelerated need for integration between the online as well as the offline world. We will adopt a hybrid and flexible model to carry out daily activities and straddle almost seamlessly between the physical and virtual realms. 2021 will see introduction and growth of 5G enabled tools from extended reality, which is a mix of virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality to virtual healthcare. The COVID-19 has fertilized the ground to compel all of us to go further into what the World Economic Forum called the fourth industrial revolution. As technology companies continue to generate some of the highest level of profit, advantage and growth, technological innovations will take a stronger and faster pace. There will be a fusion of technology in the cognitive, physical, digital and environmental realms. As digital intelligence is being integrated into major devices around us, technology will drive transitioning from Internet of Things to intelligence of everything. Many of the innovations have integrated and will integrate what used to be unrelated systems and technologies. It will blur borders and boundaries between marketplaces, industries, enterprises, disciplines and jobs. The size, scope, scale, speed and strength of these innovations will make seismic, deep and long-term changes to the world. Increasingly, technology will be used to augment human capabilities and contributions and even replace many workers, especially those who are performing routine tasks. There will be a gold rush to invest in the next round of killer apps, including Internet of Things, autonomous vehicles, flying taxis, advanced 3D printing systems, remote surgery, smart cities, and AI-driven automations. Innovations in video conferencing, collaborative tools, and productivity-enhancing software will help organizations and workers to scale new heights in terms of results and contributions. Technology used at home is expected to evolve rapidly to become more immersive, exciting and affordable so as to keep families informed, entertained and healthy. Startups will emerge from the woods with out-of-box tools to help workers work remotely, interact and collaborate in virtual offices and achieve higher productivity. For example, they will help organizations to recreate serendipitous water cooler virtual conversations to spark new ideas and innovations. There will be major changes in terms of digital governance. Technology firms have grown tremendously in recent times. Currently, the top six firms with the highest market capitalization are technology firms. They are Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, and even Tesla, which can be assumed to be a technology company. 
we have a growing influence and in some cases undue influences on the general population. More than 3.96 billion people or more than half of the population of the world are on social media. It is unfortunate that social media are some of the biggest purveyors of lies, half-truths and misinformation. With technology exerting greater influence on social, political and economic spheres, governments will track technology more closely and critically and regulate its use. For example, in January 2021, technology companies such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and in an indirect way, Apple and Google made an unprecedented move to curb the then president Donald Trump's messages through their platforms. Notwithstanding the rationale and legitimacy of the move, it raises many questions that may affect the safety, stability, and security of the world. Should we allow private companies to dictate and define boundaries of permissible conversations and messages? Should we let them play an outsized role in influencing public and even private engagements, and in doing so, shape landscapes of our communities and society? Should we give them the power and online loudspeakers to affect political and policy discourse and direction? Should we let them become purveyors of fake news and other misinformation without proper transparency and accountability? There is a growing need to upgrade governance policies and standards to regulate use of technology in an ethical, fair and efficient way. Set up common standards to facilitate and control cross-border data flows, digital trade and commerce, and digital payments and other services. There will be unconventional schemes to tax technology firms, especially those providing cross-border services. As technology becomes more pervasive and critical in our lives, including workplaces, Governmental leaders have to collaborate to set up measures to ensure cybersecurity and foster a safer and more secure online space. We will now examine another tectonic plate, climate change. The COVID-19 pandemic is a wake-up call to humanity. We have been forewarned for years to prepare for a pandemic, yet when the pandemic finally hit us, many countries started to press the panic button. 2021 will be a year when there will be greater emphasis on combating climate change and developing cleaner industries and green technologies. Companies that are not aligned to these values will increasingly be challenged in the post COVID-19 world. The COVID-19 pandemic is a clarion call for humanity to take stronger and speedier action to respond to global threats. As previously mentioned, many of these global threats can affect any country or for that matter, the world at large. One of the greatest threats in our lifetime is climate change. According to Bill Gates, Climate change could be the worst crisis, and it can be more devastating than the COVID-19 pandemic. With the rise of Earth temperature, we have witnessed a higher frequency and severity of hazards, including global warming, wildfires, droughts, floods, typhoons, and cyclones. As these hazards as these hazards become more intense and frequent, there will be lesser capacity and time to prepare and respond properly. Just as, just as importantly, climate change can trigger other disruptive and disastrous effects. For example, portions of the Arctic and Antarctic sea ice and Greenland ice sheets 
are beginning to melt and disintegrate. This phenomenon will increase the sea level and at the same time release large amounts of methane and carbon dioxide. That will in turn further increase the rate of global warming. There will be other cascading effects of climate change that may threaten the survival of many communities. For example, global warming has affected supply of food and water. Many of the devastating effects of climate change will remain latent and with further exacerbation, it may reach a tipping point. In other words, the latency will reach a threshold and beyond which small change in the global temperature can lead rapidly to major disasters. For example, as the planet gets hotter, the heat that has been trapped by the oceans will be unleashed to cause what might be called natural crisis, but they are in essence man-made crisis. As the capacity and capability to adapt to climate change varies from community to community and country to country, climate change will deepen poverty, inequality, malnutrition, healthcare, and other problems. Research in climate change has suggested that global warming can only be stopped by achieving zero net greenhouse gas emissions. At the same time, there's a growing need to speed up scale and pace of adaptation to growing climate risk. To combat climate change, we need global commitment, cooperation and collaboration. Policies and investments are needed to protect people, infrastructure, ecosystems, industries and communities that are exposed to threats of climate change. And relocate and resettle people and access to safer and more sustainable locations. Many countries are incorporating responses to climate change as part of the economic recovery and transformational plan. Let me state a few examples. President Joe Biden has announced that the United States will re-enter the Paris Climate Agreement which Mr. Trump had formally exceeded in November 2020. President Biden wants the United States being the second largest emitter of greenhouse gases to stop contributing to climate change by 2050. China pledged to be carbon neutral by 2060. The European Union has agreed to cut greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050. Japan has pledged to be carbon neutral by 2050. India has set a target of cutting down its carbon footprints by 30 to 35 percent. What are the impacts of climate change on business? Issues related to climate change can make major adverse impacts on company. Let me go through some of the major categories of risk. First, reputational risk. Consumers are increasingly becoming more educated on the risk and dangers of climate change. They are demanding companies to make necessary changes to combat climate change. If they are not satisfied with the company's responses, they may stop patronizing the company. In addition, they may even resort to being involved in a name and shame initiative to pressure the company to take the necessary action. Going green is no longer just part of a plan. It is a requirement for business to survive and thrive in the near future. Second, existential risk. Companies that are directly involved or are supporting businesses that rely on fossil fuel, coal, oil and dirty gas will eventually face redundancy and obsolescence. Third, regulatory risk. Governments all over the developed world are increasingly imposing mandatory reporting requirements for companies to ensure 
that they meet a high standard of impact and added value in social, environmental, and governance areas. They may take actions against companies that do not comply with these standards. Fourth, financial risk. There will be policy interventions such as incentives for use of green energy and low carbon technologies, carbon taxes and compliance to energy efficiency and carbon emission standards. There will also be disincentives for use of fossil fuels and other resources that contribute to climate change. These regulatory measures will increase investment and operational costs. In addition, lenders may also impose a higher interest to compel companies to lower their carbon emission and contribute to the green economy. Fifth, physical risk. Physical risk are risks that are directly related to climate change, such as being exposed to flooding, bushfire, and typhoons. Six, transitional risk. Transitional risk are risks that are related to changing of business model operation so as to clean up energy sources, reduce carbon emission, and retrofit systems and infrastructure to improve efficiency and sustainability. Seven, investment risk. Investors are increasingly becoming more socially conscious. They invest with climate mitigation and sustainable business in mind. There is a growing body of evidence that suggests that companies with good environmental, social, and governance standards provide better returns. This is possibly due to better reputation, growth opportunities, cost control, and a more committed and engaged purpose-driven workforce. The COVID-19 pandemic has given us a glimpse of what is possible if we work together to tackle climate change. At various points, many have witnessed the sky clearing up. Canal canals and drains became less murky. Pollution was reduced. Plants and flowers bloomed around us. Some animals were even seen roaming in urban areas. It was said that the satellite images on NASA's website showed that the decrease in industrial, business, and transportation activities between January and February 2020 has reduced the levels of atmospheric nitrogen dioxide, first in Wuhan and then across the country. Even though these good signs were temporary, it should remind us that the major cause of pollution is human activity. It should give us hope that together as a human race, we can overcome or reduce climate change and create a more sustainable future. The solution for climate change begins and ends with each and every one of us. And for us to remind our governments that we need to protect planet Earth, the only home that we may have in our lifetime. As I've said at the beginning of this webinar, 2021 will be a year of perturbation. 2021, will either be one of the most exciting or challenging year in your life. The choice is entirely yours. 2021 can be a defining and also a refining point. Years later, many will ask you, how did you live through? Years later, some people may ask you, how did you live through one of the worst crises of our generation? I trust you will tell them that 2021 brought out the best in you. You were at the best place 
and at the best of time to make the greatest impacts on the people and environment around you. 2021 is also a year of transformation. Vaccination, stabilization and restoration are not good enough. You and your organization need transformation. Transform yourself and your team or organization in order to survive and thrive in the post-COVID-19 world. We will be launching a series of webinars and video interviews of leaders in different fields to help you on your journey. Please don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel to be updated with these programs. Suffice to say, the world is changing at an unprecedented pace. As they said, what has worked for you in the past will not work for you in the future. If you travel on the same road, you will reach the same destination. To reach a better destination, you need to improve the road or find a better road. Or better still, create and develop the best roads and help others to also reach their desired destinations. While you cannot predict and prevent the pandemic, that does not mean that you have to resign yourself to apathy, passiveness, and complacency. You can proactively develop an efficacious mindset, model, culture, operation, and condition. In doing so, you can pioneer, respond to, and leverage on the pandemic to propel yourself to the next level of growth. Remember, if you don't change the changes around you and within you for the better, these changes may eventually change you for the worse. In time past, new models, structures, systems, technologies, and processes have been developed to improve effectiveness, efficiency, and efficacy. Every major change, challenge, and conflict has put an end to long-held position, powers, possessions, practices, and other preferences. However, improved outcomes, results, and impacts have not made humans totally irrelevant, redundant, or replaceable. In fact, they have created many opportunities and possibilities. The industrial age redeployed humans and animals for other purposes and pursuits. Similarly, the informational age created new breakthroughs that allow us to scale up and step up to a higher plane. In the past, the advent of computers and other technologies saw many prophets of doom predicting the death knell of conventional businesses and business practices. They also painted many doomsday scenarios. While it's true that a lot of businesses collapsed by the wayside, there were also many others that were transformed to become stronger and better. The workforce was generally repositioned, reskilled, and retooled to be deployed for new tasks, jobs, careers, industries, businesses, markets, and other opportunities. Through it all, we have also witnessed eradical through it all, we have also witnessed eradication of poverty like never before and an era of unprecedented progress. Our Creator has given us one of the greatest gifts, the power of choice, the option to move forward and bring forth greater good are in our hands. If you look out for opportunities and possibilities, you will find many ways to do well and do good 
especially as a result of technological advancement and other major disruptions. You have the power to create accelerated and scalable solutions to make the world a better home. Are you complaining about the darkness or lighting up a candle to lead others out of darkness? Let's be mindful that the world is at an inflection point. We are standing at the threshold of a new age, an age that's supported by accelerated growth of advanced technology. If you plan and play your game well, you can be one of the winners of a new Renaissance age. If you plan and play your games well, you can be one of the winners of a new Renaissance age. So what are you going to do in 2021 and beyond to make your life and organization really count? The brightest, the brightest future is up for grabs. Seize your destiny now. Thank you.